late night snacking, high fat, high calorie, traditional sort of chips uh, that's there. Why is late night snacking so damaging to the gut in particular? So there's so many reasons why late night snacking as a concept and philosophy, it's bad. It's, well, we have this circadian clock, right? The sort of body clock, which guides when we feel tired, when we want to wake up, when we want to sleep. And our energy dips as the day progresses. Our digestive system follows a similar pattern to our energy levels. We experience peak digestive prowess somewhere between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. It will vary slightly, but that's when your digestion is most active and most powerful. And your digestive juices are flowing, your colonic motility and gut motility is, you know, humming along, and it's good to front load your calories as early in the day as you can. As the sun sets and as the day gets on, your digestive function declines, where the secretion of bile, digestive juices all declines as well. And if you're consuming a lot of calorific foods and meals closer to bed, then it's going to be harder to digest. You increase the risk of acid reflux, bloating, and general digestive discomfort, right? And that's in alignment with chronogastroenterology, which is this idea of meal timing and nutrient timing as well. You may not even absorb the nutrients as well later in the day based on all of these things. And even your microbiome will probably feel a bit sleepier later on during the day as well. They also are slave to this master clock. That's one of the reasons. Another reason would just be simply that you need to let your gut just have moments of no food. Because when you don't eat, that's when the MMC or the migratory motor complex, which is this wave of contractions of the muscle in the intestines are sweeping through, clearing debris, clearing dead cells, and essentially like a biological Roomba for your gut and just cleaning stuff. You need that gut reset. And if you're constantly snacking and late night slacking, you're not allowing that migratory motor complex to activate. It stops as soon as you start eating. It's like you switch the light on. Oh, it stops. It's like Toys R Us. I mean, not Toys R Us. Toy Story. It's like when you watch... The toys are like pretending to be dead. And when the door closes, that's when they start talking and doing all their stuff. So that's also a reason. And the third reason is because it takes around 90 minutes for 50% of the content from your stomach to empty into the small intestine. And so if you're eating close to bed, you're not giving enough time for your stomach to empty its content. And you're increased in risk of discomfort and reflux, which could actually impact your sleep. You know, occasionally one thing here or there is not going to throw you off. But if you're regularly relying on something as part of your routine, yeah. you should at least know, you know, the risk reward. Short term reward of, you know, pleasure. And long term, you understand the damage that it could have. And also, too, you know, no, no shade on anybody who is regularly late night snacking, especially with ultra processed foods. But to me, it's usually an indication that you didn't properly fuel throughout the day. The body all of a sudden doesn't just get crazy hungry at random times if you've appropriately fueled. So where could you early in the day have more fiber, have more protein, have more polyphenol rich foods, uh, whatever needed to feel like, and, and the appropriate levels of calories. You know, I always worry when I have friends who, um, go on uh, these periods of time where, you know, way back in the day, like juice cleanses were popular. People would lower their calories to like a really, really low level, trying to get ready for a wedding or whatever it might be. Um, I would always worry because of the rebound effect. You know, you kind of starve yourself during the day and at night, your just body is so famished that it'll just reach for whatever and your willpower is low too and you'll just crush things so that your body can at least feel that it got something in. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, for all the reasons you mentioned as well and that I've just discussed, yeah, late night stacking is definitely F tier as a concept. All right, we'll throw it on our F. It's our first F that's here. Uh, S, anything came to mind on an S? Yeah, I mean, just absolutely God tier is beans. Any legumes? Any bean, pretty much, I would say, from like both fiber and protein and just general how it's such a functional, optimal food. Yeah, that is, that is S tier. Right, well, I, don't, I don't have a photo of a bean, but we'll put it on there. Now, if I had my own personal one, and we talked about this a little bit before, unfortunately, beans for me, 
are going to be a D. And that's oh. only because I eat a bean and you're definitely going to know that I ate okay. beans. Okay. I, for whatever reason, I think I shared with you, Yeah. I grew up Indian vegetarian diet. I'm no longer vegetarian anymore, but I used to have so many beans and lentils and other stuff. And I would look forward to having them on a regular basis. Uh, I didn't like spicy food that always kind of messed with my system. And then there was this period of time where I stopped having beans as much, probably when I went on my journey of, you know, being a raw foodist, maybe some sprouted beans occasionally. Um, and then I, uh, I don't know what it was. Maybe I just didn't have them, but does even sometimes the smallest amount of chickpeas make me feel so bloated and off. But again, I've learned from somebody like you that there are so many incredible sources of fiber that are out there. So if one category of foods doesn't work for you, don't worry. There's so many other things that you can eat that can do a body good. Yeah. I, you know, and I think also maybe is there a way to get you to retrain your gut for beans? Like, you know, pressure cook them, steam them, and start with like a low intake of beans and you slowly up it. But yeah, I mean, listen, there are so many hundreds of fiber rich compounds out there, thousands, you know, just unlocked, waiting to be unlocked in nature. You can miss so many different sources and still find something that works for you. There's been an increasing understanding that our oral health also supports our gut health. And if you have poor oral health, gum disease, uh, bad oral microbiome, there's some companies that are in that space that are starting to kind of look at that, that you're also swallowing saliva throughout the day too. And that can um, have detrimental impact on your gut health as well too. So you made a list on a video um, a little while ago talking about some essentials that if you care about your gut health, you want to make sure you prioritize. And I think we have an image of it over here and some of them are going to be familiar to people and some of them may not be as familiar to people, but basically we have mouthwash with an X through it. You're going to explain that in a second. We have a tongue scraper, we have floss, and we have an electric toothbrush. Talk to us about the connection between oral health and gut health. Sorry to interrupt, but memory loss is on the rise. And that's why I've created a free guide that you can get right now featuring the top brain boosting foods that you can include into your diet starting today to help you combat this. I've worked with a few of my friends to feature five foods in this free guide. And guess what? A couple of them will probably surprise you. Make sure you're one of the people that focuses on keeping your brain sharp by downloading this guide today. Just click on the link below or scan the QR code and I'll send you the guide right away. Your gut health starts in your mouth. You know, it's the kind of first part of the GI tract, your oral cavity, and you've got this whole ecosystem of bacteria and microbes that live in there as well. Now, they have overlapping roles with some of the gut bugs, but also they have some unique roles that they perform as well, not only keeping, you know, your sort of mouth and oral cavity tidy and kind of well-maintained, but some of these guys are producing, uh, you know, nitric oxide, which is a potent vasodilator and widens the blood vessels, and it's good for vascular health and heart health. So when you don't take care of your oral microbiome, you could put yourself at higher risk of heart disease, hypertension, high blood pressure, a bunch of other things as well. So we know from a lot of these epidemiological studies that poor oral health, periodontitis, gum disease can increase the risk of other things like Alzheimer's, dementia. And there's even been some studies linking certain types of pathogenic bacteria found in the sort of gum lining, like Fusobacterium nucleatum, and then they've found that same pathogenic bacteria in colonic polyps, which are growths in the colon, which are precursors to colon cancer. So we are just beginning to sort of unlock that bit of the oral microbiome. We are still way behind in our understanding of the oral microbiome compared to the gut microbiome. But, you know, they are intrinsically linked as well. Mm. Fantastic. So I'm guessing if you're going to take these and you didn't mention mouthwash, but maybe you could, if we're going to rank them, we'll probably throw them up here as an A, these daily habits that are there for you. Uh, so is that all of them? Uh, essentially, it's avoiding mouthwash, tongue scraping, flossing regularly and using an electric toothbrush. Yeah, I think we should probably go ahead and put that as S tier. Okay, yeah, great. Because we got our like, first S tier. Yeah, th those things should be core habits as like... 
I wouldn't even say like luxury. Oh, it's nice if you do. Everyone should be flossing. Everyone should be brushing twice a day, ideally with an electric toothbrush if you can. You should be avoiding alcohol mouthwashed on a regular basis. There are some cases in which you might need that, like certain dental procedures, or if someone has some specific chronic gum or mouth issues, they may be prescribed alcohol-based mouthwashes in certain places. But for the average person, like you or I, those core habits are key. Amazing. All right, there's one other daily supplement that's become super duper popular that I wanted to get you to chime in on. And there's all sorts of different versions of this product that are around the same. And that's your daily greens superfood product. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. It takes around 90 minutes for 50% of the content from your stomach to empty into the small intestine. If you're eating close to bed, you're not giving enough time for your stomach to empty its content.